don't bother switching the videos. We're on all those other channels, too. I'm Dax, and I'm happy to announce What's Under the Bed is an official affiliate of Fangoria Magazine. What does that mean for you? Savings. That's what it means. Go to shop.fangoria.com or follow the links in the description. Use the code What's Under the Bed with Dax and get 20% off your entire order. That applies to first-time subscribers and one-time orders. That's 20% off of all the Fangoria swag. Pins, hats, shirts, mugs, beanies, and horror mags. What code? What's under the bed with Dax? Which one? What's under the bed with Dax? I can't tell you how excited we are at What's Under the Bed to be involved with Fangoria. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Now, enjoy the interview. Rob Schmidt is my guest today. He's a writer, director, and professor of film at Emory University. His film, Wrong Turn, is a fan favorite, cult classic, and even Stephen King named it his favorite movie of the year. Rob became an official master of horror with the making of Right to Die for the series Masters of Horror. This pla it places him among other masters, including John Carpenter, Toby Hooper, Wes Craven, and recent What's Under the Bed guest, the great Joe Dante. Uh, in addition to features, he's made dozens of short films, documentaries, and music videos. He's worked on television series for NBC, Showtime, and Fox. His feature, Crime and Punishment in Suburbia, was a Sundance favorite. He also loves teaching and has taught for NYU grad film is the new school and currently at Emory University in Atlanta. Rob, it's nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so you were born in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania on a 50 acre farm until you were around seven years old before moving to New York part time with, with uh, part of the time with your mother. Uh, you said Slippery Rock was a small farm town surrounded by strange people who became the inspiration of your, for your films. What do you remember about your time in Slippery Rock? <sighs> Boy, um, well, it was, it was, you know, it was all that I knew when I was a kid and it was, it was a strange and, um, kind of creepy place and also a really beautiful place. Uh, it was, um, it was in the middle of, um, some woods and there were some unused pastures behind the house. Actually, <clears throat> This is not something I remember, but this is something my uh, my mom remembers, which is a, a ghost story. Can I tell it? Yeah, sure. Of course. Okay, so um, I was born in the, the mid-60s, and um, my uh, parents had bought this uh, farm in the middle of nowhere. They had, uh, they had been from uh new york lived in new york philadelphia that sort of like urban setting and um they had decided that they would live out in the country and um they had met at university of pennsylvania my dad was a southeast asian studies expert and he had um at that time they still called the people before his generation they called them orientalists which now is a racist term, but it was people who had studied and were experts on the, the Far East, you know. And there was this old um, nun, Miss Allen, who had been a missionary in China. And she had been around the, the Far East and she had settled in the middle of nowhere in Western Pennsylvania. And uh, she had built um, like a Zen rock garden and a bamboo garden and a Chinese chestnut grove. And uh, she had all these strange, really beautiful things that she'd built that she remembered from Asia. And they were all uh, at this piece of land in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. And um, it was so pretty and unusual that people would sometimes like drive there on weekends to like walk in the gardens and whatnot. And she had gotten too old to take care of it. And so she sold it to uh, my father. Um, and that was where I was born, you know? Um, and I, I remember being very little and like being by myself, like three or four years old in like surrounded by bamboo, uh, you know, groves and things like that. And um, some people thought it was the most beautiful place on earth, actually. Um, 
Well, in any case, at that point, my dad was teaching in Pittsburgh and it was about an hour's drive away. And when he would teach at night, the class would end at, you know, 10 or 1030. And then he would drive and get home around midnight to this farm. And my mom would stay up she's now she's an old Italian lady, but then she was a young Italian woman, I guess. And, uh, she would drink coffee and stay up. And, uh, um, our house was a little farmhouse. So it had, um, it was like, kind of like, a Cape Cod, uh, like one story. If you walked in the front door on the right side, there was a dining room with a half wall and then a country kitchen. And on the left side, if you walked in, there was a living room and there was a, a bathroom behind the living room. And then um, there were stairs. You open the front door and there are stairs going up to, you know, uh, what is not quite a second floor because it has, uh, the roof is slanted. Um, my mom was sitting in the kitchen reading. They would get, this is before the internet and they would get the New York Times and it would come the day after it was published. So they would read the news from the day before, believe it or not, which is mind blowing in terms of now. And uh, she's a mile from any other human beings. It's about midnight and um, she's in the kitchen and she hears a noise and she looks up and there's a man in the dining room staring at her. Uh, staring at her with wild eyes. And um, he looks like a janitor. He's kind of covered in dirt and uh, um, a mess. And he has these wild eyes. And when they see each other, when he realizes that she sees him, he turns, he turns to go back towards the front door. And my mom's like, oh my God. And she hears him go up the stairs. And uh, she thinks, uh, oh, my God, the children are upstairs. And uh, she ran after him. He ran into the nursery where my brother, my sister and I were. She ran up to the nursery. And he was not there. And there was a 25 foot drop to concrete below the window. So. Uh, my, uh, my dad gets home and my mom tells him about it. And he says, uh, you imagined it, you, you know, you must have imagined it. And she's like, I, you know, I know what I saw. And um, I know what I saw. And, um, and she to this day says, I, I don't believe in ghosts, but I know what I saw. And she, uh, a few weeks later, my dad had gone to visit the old nun. Uh, and she, um, she told him that uh, her, uh, her nephew had died in Vietnam actually that night and um, he had been blown up. And he, he used to work, he used to work at the property and he had said it was the most beautiful place on earth. So uh, my, what my mom thinks is he was visiting it before he left, you know? Dang. Yeah, but it, so it was, it was that kind of place. It was a really strange place, you know? That was an amazing start to this interview. Holy crap, that's <laughs> amazing. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Before the, <laughs> before the influence of movies, what scared you the most as a child? Was there a fear of the dark, something under the bed, what? You know, that's, a, that's an amazing question. It's a great question. Um, that's a great question. Uh, and, um, boy, I, you know, I've spent some time trying to figure this out because I was, um, uh, my, my dad was a, a combat veteran and he had a PTSD and he would get violent. He was a really good, interesting guy, but he would get violent. And, um, and there was a fair amount of shouting and whatnot when I was a kid. And um, I was certainly scared of my dad or I was scared of my dad's anger, which maybe was being scared of my dad. And I was, I was scared of adults. And, um, you know, I only, 
when we lived on the farm, I, I went to only one movie uh, that entire time. Uh, my dad took us to the theater in, I want to say Grove City, Pennsylvania, uh, to see a children's movie called, that was a book too, called My Side of the Mountain. Um, and then I, uh, what was I scared of? I was certainly scared. Uh, I was scared of my dad. I was scared of my dad being angry. I was, I was definitely scared of the dark, but you know, a thing that happens is like, I remember my sister hearing a noise when later on my parents built like a little bedroom back behind where the bathroom was. So there was an extension on the house and they were downstairs and my sister was in one of the rooms upstairs and my younger brother and I were in the room that uh, Ms. Allen's nephew left uh, the earth from. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, my sister heard a noise and uh, she wanted us to all go down to my parents' room, you know, in the dark. And I was the one that uh, was assigned to lead us through the dark. And it was terrifying. I must have been maybe I was six, you know, and I did go first and I couldn't see, and I had my heart arm in front of me and I was aware that my arm could be eaten, you know, and that I might die. Uh, but I did get us to my parents' room. Um, and I think for better or for worse, a lot of the way I've approached scary situations is, uh, to, you know, engage them to, uh, to, um, you know, get, get in the mix. It sounds better than it is. Uh, I was about to say, get in the mix, even though I'm scared, but that sounds like courage. And, uh, honestly, I was just terrified, but doing it anyway. So did I answer your question? I, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I believe so. I think you would. I think that would be an answer. Yeah. Um, so many kids are first introduced to horror through fairy tales and children's stories like the, the juniper tree or Billy Goat Scruff. Uh, was there any particular story that scared you the most as a child? Um, boy, I'm trying to think. There's an Italian monster named Manjolette. Uh, Manjas to eat, you know, and uh, Manjolette eats children that aren't asleep. Um, and so that was scary. Uh, my mom felt the need to tell us about that so that we wouldn't leave our beds. Uh, so that was that was a scary thing. And you know, I'll tell you too, and this is another thing about being around a lot of nature is it um, it freaked me out. Like I, I remember uh, at one point um, having, I think it was an inchworm on me and screaming for my sister to get it off of me. You know, I was terrified of like bugs and things like that. You know, uh, I, I distinctly remember that. And another thing I was terrified of, this is a little later, are leeches, because we would go swimming in the pond and get bit by leeches. And um, I would be so panicked. You know, you're supposed to hit them with a cigarette butt or something to make them release. I can't even remember what you're supposed to do. But what I would do is realize I had been bit by a leech and I was bleeding and then hysterically grab it and tear it off which, you know, makes you get an infection from that because it breaks off in your wound. Um, and uh, in any case, things like that, um, things like that I was terrified of. So that made me scared of, scared of water where I couldn't see the bottom of the water too. Because we, we did a lot of swimming in places where you couldn't see uh, the bottom, you know? <laughs> My father showed me the blob when I was around seven years old. And oh my he... God. Okay. <laughs> that and was the second, uh, Son of Blob was the second movie I saw. Yeah. In, in the scene where the blob leaps from the stick onto the, into old man's hand, uh, I got so scared. I had, I had him turn it off. Uh, I couldn't watch that movie again for years, even after I had seen other movies like The Exorcist. I, and now I've watched it since and I love it to death. Um, can you tell, uh, can you tell me about when you first watched Son of the Blob? 
Yeah, I, um, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that I, I love that you saw that when you were little. I, uh, it, um, that the seventies were not um, a high point for parenting. There wasn't a lot of supervision, and um, there were a couple of kids from an alcoholic family uh, down the block that um, we. I don't know if my dad drove us or how it worked, but we ended up at a movie theater with them and with a little bit of money uh, to get food. Um, and it was a matinee of the son of Blob. And it was so terrifying to me that sometimes I would have to leave the theater, you know, and I would stand out in the lobby. And I also, I'm salivating because I'm thinking of this delicious thing. They had, um, packages of I think I've seen it as an adult but it's a it's it's a rare candy to see is uh pre-packaged cotton candy like it comes in a vacuum packed bag it's not like from the machine have you had it <laughs> well no this is a future question would that have been your go-to snack from the concession stand it was that day I mean I'm, I'm literally now, so I'm 56 and I'm salivating thinking about the delicious <laughs> cotton candy so uh i tend to eat reese's peanut butter cups but um and i i i eat you know popcorn with the stuff on it that they the butter ish stuff on it but it's uh it's you know that's i don't i don't particularly like it but i can't stop eating it but in any case that yeah i'm not that my experience of son of blob was uh i it was absolute terror i was seven when i saw it some you know around the age you were and um and a thing that i discovered about it though was that i could leave like and i guess you discovered you could turn it off but that i i could leave but also that i wanted to go back and see more of it you know which is interesting uh and i, I i'm not sure if it i used to think that horror horror movies were good because they allow people to test their capacity for fear in a safe place, you know, um, like much better than seeing how fast you can drive a car, for instance, but, um, <laughs> you know, which can kill you and other people. But um, yeah, yeah. So that was, that was, that was cool. Cause it was something that I could watch and be entirely engaged in it and then leave it if it was too hard to watch. Um. So you you have said you spent a lot of your childhood watching movies in the theater. You've, you're mentioning the theater a lot, so that adds to that. Um, did you gravitate towards horror movies, or would you watch anything? Yeah, I have. Um, especially as a kid, I, I had a an odd relationship to horror films. I mean, uh, movies and more specifically movie theaters were a really big deal for me as a kid because they were there were they were a place where I could feel safe you know and um, I could feel safe and I could be on adventures and it was it was dark like sometimes now like I'll be hanging out in a room without a light on and I'm totally happy to do that and then my partner will come in and turn the light on. I'll be like, oh, why did you do that? You know, uh, like <laughs> um, I when I was a kid, I used to go to movies without knowing what they were. Like I might not even know. It might just be the title and I would go to it. You know, I went to so many movies that that was like a thing. But um, yeah, now now I'm more cautious about what I go see. But uh, but in terms of horror, actually i got to a point where for a while i thought that horror was was evil you know like i thought it was i thought it was evil's maybe too metaphysical uh I, I thought that it was destructive like i thought that horror films were destructive um and so i didn't watch them very much um but I still, I still watch them. I just didn't watch them very much. And then I got really interested in them when I was in my early twenties because they, they make such a great 
they're, they're a really powerful visceral experience for like audiences, you know? And um, they're just, they're just, they're, they're, and the, and the ones that I like the most, mm, that's hard to say. I was about to say the ones that I like the most are adventures with good outcomes or relatively good outcomes, but um, like there are some apocalyptically bad outcomes that I still like. Uh, and I'm trying to think of, I, I'm, I hesitate to use it because people just mention it all the time and I think they mention it for the wrong reasons, but like Rosemary's baby, you know, at the end, the, the Satan child is born and uh, excuse me, it's, um, that's a really terrible outcome, but, uh, <laughs> but it's a great movie. It's like a great movie, you know, um, uh, session nine. Yeah. Did you ever see session nine? No. Uh, it's worth checking out. I, I, I like it. Some people don't really think much of it, but uh, it, it's, it's a movie that the, the ending is just like a hopeless ending, you know? Huh. I'm, I plan, I now plan on watching that. <laughs> oh, hopelessness. <laughs> Generally, Intrigued. I'm not a fan of hopelessness, but yeah. I, I, I have more of a taste for it now than I did. Um. So I, I'm going to quickly move on to a new question. You've you you raised two daughters. Uh, what do you think is a good age for kids to explore horror movies? Hmm. Um, you know, uh, I should say one of my one of my kids is gender fluid, and so I I would say I I raised two kids. Two kids. And, okay. Um, but, yeah. But, no, it's all good. And um, you know, I think it depends. I think it really depends. It depends on the individual kid and their appetites and their capacities. And I'll tell you a thing that really wrecked me um, was, again, when I was really little, uh, my parents were at some academic convention and it was, uh, at, not that it matters, but it was at a college in Florida. Actually, there was, and there was an alligator there. It must've been at Florida State and there was an alligator there who was the mascot. Um, but in the evening, they were trying to find stuff to do with two, three little kids. And uh, they, um, there was a film screening and it was, uh, it was uh, Beauty and the Beast, the original um, Cocteau version. And um, like that has, it has, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's black and white and, and in the Beast's palace, it's lit by sconces and the sconces are real human arms that are alive holding torches. And when I realized that the arms, that the light come, the torches on the walls were like disembodied human arms, I like lost my shit. Like I started crying hysterically. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you that was, that was what, that was too early for me to see that movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound terrifying now but i literally like was hysterical you know um <laughs> so yeah I, I i think it's i think it's up to the kid and the parents and it, it you know there are things that are really good about it I, i'll tell you this though i think if you're with people that you, you trust and enjoy like you can do pretty much anything um I believe one of your first video cameras was a Fisher Price Pixel Ver Vision VHS camera. Oh, how oh, old yeah. were That's you funny when that you know that? <laughs> <laughs> how old were you when you started making videos with any sort of narrative structure? Um, you know, I I don't predate video, but I I almost do. So um, um, when we were in we did, we had a dark room in our house uh, for black and white still photography when I was a like really little kid. We always, we actually always had one. I was born in a, in, at the farm, there was a dark room. Um, and then um, in high school, we did some, we did some videos, but I kind of came to filmmaking through photography like the idea that I could actually make films came from 
taking pictures and writing stories and then being like, well, I should make films because that's super, super fun, you know? So it was, it was later. I, I, it was when I got to film school and was like 19 years old that I started really getting into movies, making, making, making them myself. Yeah. Would, it, would any of those films still exist? Um, boy, I'm trying to think. One I know exists is not, uh, it's a documentary film called Earl's Demise. It's 12 minutes long and it was about uh, my dad when he was dying of dementia. Um, and it, it includes me firebombing an abandoned Volkswagen bug uh, with gasoline bombs. Um, <laughs> but I'm not sure how many other, I'm not sure if there's much else that exists from then. Uh, it's, yeah, it's nice that you're asking that because it's making me think, think about that stuff. But, uh, you know, and, and for what it's worth, hold on to, you know, I guess it's easier to hold on to your films now, but um, there's actually even from early on in the internet era, I made some little tiny short films that I really liked uh, for some companies that like just disappeared. And uh, I don't have copies of them and I don't know where they are anymore. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little disappointed by that. So like for everybody out there that's listening, like save your stuff someplace, you know? Um. I read I read you would take the money you earned with a paper route and spend it on candy and video games. What were your favorite arcade games? Boy, well, I, I kind of span the whole, like, okay, so when, when I started playing video games, there was, uh, there was a submarine game. I want to say it was called uh, Seawolf where you like look through like a periscope and fired at, you know, stuff. And, um, and there was a, there was a shooting game that had like real BBs, you know, but it was in a glass case. Uh, and then I was around when Pac-Man started, <laughs> believe it or not. And, uh, you know, um, I can't remember what the first, what was the first Mario? Was it Donkey Kong? Donkey Kong, yeah, it was Donkey Kong. Yeah, I was, I was literally like, I remember like, yo, there's a new one, Donkey Kong. It's at the Seven Eleven, like, you know, when it was still like okay for children to hang out at Seven Elevens. Uh, um, and then one of the first ones I got really excited about was called Defender, and it was a uh, space one with a, uh, you know, where you were flying um, uh, some kind of fighter and dropping bombs and firing on things. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And and there were like arcade culture was like a big deal. Like you, you didn't really play that stuff at home. You went to an arcade and played it, you know, which is weird now. I mean, I guess there's still arcades. Do you go to arcades? Not uh, really, right? I, don't, I don't know if they exist, but I have an arcade machine over there. Uh, uh, uh. Just a, it's a multicade. And then I also have one there, which has Defender on it. Oh, are you serious? Oh, that's it crazy. has Defender on it. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I, I was just look like you mentioned Defender, and I was looking like because it's like multiple arcade games, and I was looking, and I just saw Defender on the side of it. I was like, it's got Defender on it. You know, there was a two-person game that was super fun called Space Wars, and it was like a, uh, it was like just raster graphics, black and white, nothing. Like it had literally an asterisk that went on and off in the middle of the screen that was the sun, you know? And then it had like a really crudely drawn, um, uh, you know, enterprise from Star Trek. And it had, I wanna say, it was just like a, like a Delta fighter. And you, you fired like periods, like literally the, the white dot that is a period and you would see it like move across the screen at the other. Uh... <laughs> what is this game? I think, it, I think it's called Space Wars. I think it's literally, that... called, yeah, I bet you can find, I'm, I'm sure people have made simulators, you know? Oh, there has to be, there yeah. has to be. Super, super fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I have kind of, I, I shouldn't say I have kind of, I have an addictive personality and I figured out early on that um, I can't play 
video games because I won't stop playing them. Like I'll just like literally like I will give up, you know, it'll be like, like, you know, I was about to say my mother's funeral, but you know, my mother's alive and well, so I'm not going to, anyway, I don't want to jinx anything, but <laughs> don't you, yeah, don't I, jinx I, anything. I would just not, I would not leave. I would not leave the screen. Like I would start playing the game and then not be able to stop. And so I was like, I need to not even start. Cause when I start, it seems like it's okay. And then like 12 hours later, it's not okay. You know, <laughs> I I'm sort of similar. I'm sort of similar. <laughs> I think now they they recognize it as a mental illness, like it's uh... a. <laughs> I regret mentioning that then. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry for bringing it up. No, it's okay. No, I don't care. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go into a little deeper uh, tone now. Uh, you have described high school as being like a prison. Uh, can you speak about that? And what were you like as a teenager? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. And um, well, um, I mean, how deep are you okay to go with that? Like, I don't want to. Uh... Uh, however, however deep you want to go, I don't. I don't have a preference. <laughs> you watch R-rated movies, so I, well, I watch R-rated movies. I'm okay. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I think that. like everyone has trauma when they're kids, you know, and that's part of growing up is you, that's what most coming of age movies are, are there people like encountering, like having their first experiences with things that are too difficult to really bear, you know, and then you get through them anyway, you do end up bearing them. And um, I think for me, like I had, I had a lot of pain and fear growing up and I uh well I'll, I'll tell you this like this is a thing that's been remarkable to me lately is for most of my life I've had this picture of myself when I was a really little kid with a broken arm and I thought I was just wearing a cloth sling in the picture it was a little confusing to me because people would ask me I'd be like oh that's a picture of me when I had a broken arm but it's just a cloth sling I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that to people. I would say it's a picture of me with a broken arm, but I always remembered it as like a little cloth sling, you know? And um, I showed it to someone about six months ago when they were like, Rob, that's a cast that goes almost up to your shoulder that's strapped against your body. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, it, it does look like a cast, you know? And I've been, I've been looking at that picture for 50 years and thinking it was nothing, you know? But, uh, and I asked my mom about it and she said uh, that I was in the hospital overnight. Like they, uh, you know, which they don't, if you break an arm, they don't put you in the hospital overnight, you know? Um, and so I think that we, and, uh, and I'll tell you too, like um, when we had moved to suburbia, well before high school, when I was eight-ish, I was, uh, you know, I was sexually assaulted by a pedophile, and I didn't tell anyone about that, you know, and it was someone who was like, I will, I will kill you and your family if you tell anyone about this, you know, and um, I just kind of rolled with it, but I, I viewed the world as a dangerous place, you know, and by the time I got to high school, I was, I was, I had friends, but I was very protective of myself. Like I was very protective of myself. And, and to be completely honest, I got, you know, I got engaged in drugs because it was a way to get relief, you know? And that said, I've been clean and sober for 22 years, you know? But, um, you know, my experience of high school was not, I, I also, uh, it was hard to, I didn't trust authority, you know? So I, um, in high school, it's, my experience of it was, it's all about stupid rules. Like, you know, following rules that you don't like and like people that are not as smart as you telling you what to do. And like a lot of, a lot of stuff like that. So, um, 
it was uh, also, I, I've never been diagnosed as this, but I, I have trouble sitting still, you know, like I could never be a film editor because um, the idea of sitting in a chair for 10 hours is just like, you know, I can't do it. Like, thank God I have good friends that are excellent editors because it's, and, and like school is all about like sit in the chair and don't move, you know, and listen to someone say stuff, some of which you already know. And that was hard. That was really hard for me to do, you know? So I don't know if I, you, you asked about it being a prison. I don't think I quite described it as a prison, but it was hard. That's what I heard, but yeah. And I, I, I expect that. Um, So I'm going to switch the subject because I got, really dark really quickly um do you, do you think more songs if you don't want been... me to do that i won't do that i no, i'm no, trying no, to no. make it, it interesting but... fine. it was perfectly fine it okay was perfectly but fine. but just so you know dax i i'm just trying to make things interesting for you and your audience but i no, I, I can fine. i can do, keep it light if you want to no 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 it's perfectly fine it okay. was perfectly fine <laughs> just i'm gonna switch subjects because that did get dark um do you think more songs have been written about love lust or heartbreak Say this again. Uh, do you think more songs have been written about love, lust, or heartbreak? Dax, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you well. Do you think more songs have been written about love, what? Lust or heartbreak? Lust or heartbreak? Love, or lost, heartbreak? love lust. lost, or heartbreak? Lust. L U S T. Boy, um, love, lust, or heartbreak. You know, I, I, I think, unfortunately, more songs have been written about heartbreak, but it's for a good reason is that it's um, it's healing to sing. And so people uh, sing about sadness. They sing about joy, too. But I think that I, I, my hunch is more things have been written about heartbreak. Um, so you earned a scholarship to college and received your bachelor's degree in visual arts from SUNY from SUNY Purchase. You got a master's degree in fine arts for directing and screenwriting from the American Film Institute. What were you like as a student? Hmm. Well, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't do well in school until I was doing film work, really. Um, like, so unfortunately, you know, the first 12 years of school were kind of a wash. But, um, but then when I got into, <laughs> but then when I got into art school, it was stuff that I was really excited about, you know, and excited to learn. And, um, and uh, so I was, I was an excited and enthusiastic student. I, I may have talked too much. Uh, and I, um, I also, you know, I teach now and um, it's, disappointing to me when students don't attend class you know but I know when I was in school even though it was costing money to be in school and I liked my subjects anytime a teacher was like oh I can't come in today I would be like yes you know like just super <laughs> super excited uh about that yeah, yeah. um were your parents ever supportive of your decision to become a filmmaker? Yes, they were. Uh, they were very. They were very supportive of that, actually, and um, they were really supportive of that. And they, I actually, the way that I, the after my dad <clears throat> passed away. Um, the money from selling his farm was what uh, got me through AFI, you know? So they were very supportive of that. And, and actually um, there's a point and in hindsight, it seems like nothing, but when you're in it, it's like hellish uh, or it feels hellish is um, there's a point when you're not, you finish school and you're not, hopefully you're not successful yet, you know, and you're, um, kind of struggling to try to make your first film and scraping by or, or not scraping by, you know, and I had a stretch after grad school where it was hard to make rent. Like every month I'd be like, will I get enough gigs to make rent, you know? And um, 
I actually, this is, this sounds ridiculous. And if, if you knew me better, it would sound even more ridiculous, but um, I was living in LA, AFI's in LA, and I was living in a place called the Hollywood Flats, which sounds nice, but it's like the ghetto below the studios in Hollywood, you know, um, the scary ghetto below the studios in Hollywood. And uh, um, I would pass by these signs. There weren't enough LA County sheriffs. And there were these billboards that were like, LA County Sheriff starting salary, I can't remember, it was $62,000 a year. And um, I would pass by them and be like, should I just be a sheriff? And uh, <laughs> And I finally got to a point after like, I finally got to a point where I, I called my mom in New York and I was like, um, you know, mom, I'm thinking of not doing this anymore and, you know, applying to be an LA County Sheriff. And, uh, <laughs> and she actually, she was great. And she said, you know, Robert, you've worked for this for so long, for so many years. And I think that you should just, you know, keep working towards being a filmmaker. So, um, which, you know, I did and it worked out. So they've been supportive. Parents were supportive. Thumbs up for parents. <laughs> so your first um, professor in like that we've interviewed in the show. So um, we got an apple. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> we got an apple. <laughs> um, kids a little older than me are worried about taking on massive debt to go to college, but education is very important to get ahead. Um, do you think film school is necessary to become a filmmaker? It's not necessary. Uh, yeah, it's not necessary. And it, you know, I had, I'm sorry, I'm playing with a camera while we talk and I'll stop. <laughs> um, like I said, it's hard for me to sit for a long time. Uh, <laughs> so here's the thing is, so I went to film school for undergrad and uh, when my dad had passed away and I was trying to figure out what to do next, I was thinking I should go to grad school for film, you know, and um, uh, teacher and uh, professor James Seamus, really smart. He's done a lot, like a lot of movies. I think he did Crouching Tiger. You know, I can't, I can't remember. He's done like a million movies. And um, I, I got to talk to him because I, I was like a crew guy in New York. So people kind of knew me in the indie film scene just as like a, a helper guy, you know? And um, um, he said, uh, he, he was teaching at Columbia and he said, uh, you know, there, there's no reason for you to go to film school because you already know how to make films. And um, he said, there's no reason for you to go to Columbia because you already know how to make films. And, and all they're gonna do is teach you stuff you already know. And um, so there's that, but in my case, like I, I did want to get to teach and having an MFA is, uh, at some schools you need that in order to teach. And the other thing is that um, I was, you know, at that point in my life, I was working mostly as an electrician on film sets, like a, a, a lighting technician, you know, and um, sometimes as a production assistant still, and sometimes as a grip and sometimes in camera department, but they were gigs where like I could make my rent. I lived, I had a, I had a storefront in Alphabet City in New York, which used to be like a really harsh, tough part of town, but isn't anymore. And uh, my rent on that storefront was $500 a month. And on a good day as a grip, I would make five hundred dollars so I could make rent in a day more or less you know and um and I was like this is good because I can work on making films the rest of the time but what I did was like hang out in bars with my friends and drink and then be like ah oh, I wish I was making a film and I, I realized that for me I, I needed a uh, structure to move forward and so being at a grad school where you you know, you, you make films, you have to make films for two years was, was a really good thing for me. And, and the other thing is that if you go to, you know, I went to AFI and there were like great, they, they were just slobs at the time, like me, but they turned out, it turned out there were a bunch of great filmmakers in that class. And some of them are still friends of mine, you know? So, uh, 
uh, like filmmakers that you know like that wrote recommendations for my job at emory like you know 30 years after grad school um i heard i heard the first person you ever knew who had worked in the film industry worked on the film the stuff which we have right there oh <laughs> we have a lot of the wow <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah um who was that person and how did you know them okay so um yes that was Joseph Stockdale, um, who taught, uh, he taught, uh, what was it called? It was called dramatic, it wasn't dramatic history, it was dramatic, um, in any case, that was this old, um, awesome kind of theater queen guy who taught uh, dramatic structure. And um, I went to, you know, SUNY Purchase back in the day, they, it, it used to be a conservatory. So we were in the conservatory and you get a lecture, like when you get in at that point anyway, where they were like, it was really cheap. It was $750 a semester. It was like the cheap, it was for people that didn't want, didn't have the money to go to NYU, you know? And we would get a lecture about how we were being subsidized by the state of New York. And we had a responsibility to the state and, like all like <laughs> like they, it was almost like being the Soviet Union that that like lecture you know your responsibility to the government for them caring for you and uh and he taught us uh dramatic structure and actually and he was like an old theater queenie guy like he uh I remember once being online at the lunch place on campus and he was online and there was no one there to uh there was no one there taking care of us. And he finally shouted, uh, who do I have to fuck to get a bagel around here? Like, uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a different time, but he was comfortable doing things like that, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and he, I think he, I think, I think he ran like the Woodstock Summer Theater or something like that. Like he was not, he was not prominent in the film industry and like he he has like a cameo i think he might have one line in the stuff he's one of like the government officials in like a big black car you know but at that point i was like oh my god someone i know is in a film you know uh and it was amazing actually like it was amazing and then and then after that i had a cinematography teacher who had shot uh toxic avenger and I was like, holy smokes, he actually like has shot an entire film. You know, I was like in awe of him for having worked in industry. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know how it is with you. I mean, you're very lucky because you're getting exposed to all this great stuff. A lot of people don't, you know, like sometimes I bring people into Emory and my students don't realize like almost nobody gets to meet these people, you know. Yeah, um, my both my parents work in the film industry, and my grandmother worked in the film industry. Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, <laughs> like my my kids um, have been on sets since they were babies. You know, there's actually a picture of Blair on the set of Mortuary being held by one of the corpses when she was like nine months old. You know, um, and they um, they actually they when they get brought to set. Blair's older now, so Blair probably wouldn't do this, but they um they immediately they don't run to craft service, they run to the craft service truck, you know, that where they store the stuff and they take like whole bags of things, which is like it's kind of funny, but it's also like director's kids, you know, like you can't really stop them and they like take all the gummy bears or whatever. I but, did um, both of those things. You oh, really I went that? into I went into the trucks and craft service and just stole all the gummies. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they've had you. You and them have had a very different experience than I had. You know, with uh, with the film film industry. Yeah. Um. In two thousand, in the year two thousand, you directed Crime and Punishment in Suburbia about a high school girl who seeks redemption after murdering her abusive stepfather. The movie starred the legendary character actor Michael Ironside. Uh, please tell him we would love to have him on the show, but, but only if it comes up. Only if it comes up. <laughs> I'll let him know. <laughs> would you? Would you? Uh, would you tell me uh, what he suggested to say in the morning and evening in place of a prayer? 
Oh, good Lord. Uh, oh my gosh. Where did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I have my ways. <laughs> uh, you know, um, this is not for everybody, but it's for people that there's an old uh, biker, uh, bike resident motorcycle gang uh, affiliated people trying to do better uh, prayer, which is in the morning, um, in the morning, uh, when you get up, you get down on your knees and you say whatever. That's all you say is whatever, which means um, whatever happens, I'm going to you know make the world better. And at the end of the day, before you get ready to go to sleep, you get down on your knees and you say next. So whatever and next is that uh, is that prayer. I don't know if that's what you heard, but that's what I. I... That's exactly what we heard. <laughs> <laughs> um. Who always calls you on the last day of filming to say, you'll never work again, and then hang up? <laughs> well, I would also be Michael Ironside, yo. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about Wrong, uh, wrong Turn. Uh, this fantastic horror movie starred Elias Dushku and spawned five sequels and reboot. Uh, how did this movie come about? Um, well, um, Alan McElroy and um, and um, Brian, darn it, I'm forgetting Brian's last name. It's a problem with only calling people by their first names. Brian, uh, he's one of my best friends. Anyway, uh, Brian was a producer on the film. He Stan, was Stan Winston's, uh, you know, uh, head of production. And um, Alan was a friend of his from Ohio. And uh, um, they were trying to get that movie to go and I read it and was excited about it and then um I met with there were a few companies involved in it and I I met with each of those companies and I got attached oh here's the thing that is uh, actually worth knowing about that is that um I had made a movie it, it got released as speed of life and it was like a little tiny like gritty urban drama about uh you know, a, a guy having to kill his father. Like it was like a really dark drama, you know? And um, and it was made for nothing. And uh, Stan saw it, Stan Winston, the uh, creature maker and producer saw it. And he wanted me to do Wrong Turn because he liked how I worked with actors. So like, if you make, if you make stuff that you care about, like that, that's how you get work. Like I got wrong turn because I made like a movie that I liked, you know? Um, like there were other people that were like bigger directors than me that were up for that, but they, you know, they didn't get it. So just, just, uh, it's just, I'm just doing a pitch for make stuff you care about. <laughs> Um, so please settle a debate for me. When the house explodes, buried in the noise, it sounds like James Brown screaming at the beginning of his song, I Feel Good. Is James <laughs> Brown screaming in wrong turn? I cannot say that because that's, I believe, copywritten. Um, but I can tell you something else uh, to change the subject, as you did before, is that... Um, <laughs> is that um, the... Uh, the um, cannibals are speaking Czech to each other. <laughs> so Wrong Turn provides a showcase for Stan Winston's wonderful special makeup effects. I heard he didn't like the way you parked cars. Would you tell me a little about the late great Stan Winston's love for cars and the ability to park them properly? Uh, he, you know, he... Um, so, you know, Stan passed away, uh, Stan passed away and, and he, you know, from uh, an unusual cancer and um, there's, I don't know if this is true, but there's a history in that part of the industry, you know, in, in special makeup effects of people using a lot of different chemicals and uh, I, I don't I don't know if that was related to it, but I, I always I always pause, you know, because there's so many 
we do so many things that are like a little dubious. Uh, but um, I bring uh, Stan. Stan, like he was a really loving, kind, funny man. Like not everyone is like that, but that was his thing. And um, he was. He, he's dead, so it doesn't matter. But if he was alive, he wouldn't like this. He was sort of like a grandfather, like having your grandfather around taking care of you. And um, we were, uh, Stan, Stan had a lot of money from having lots of Academy Awards and whatnot. And um, he spent it, he bought, he had like, he, he told me once, this is before he knew he was going to die, that he had more bottles of if he drank like two bottles of wine a day he had he owned more bottles of wine than he could drink in his lifetime like uh, <laughs> and, he, and he didn't drink two bottles of wine a day but he could do that and he also bought cars and had a lot of different cars you know and um he we were driving back from dinner once to uh we were on location and uh we were staying at the same hotel and we're driving back for dinner and like i would park by just like like you know doing like a hard 90 degree turn into parking spaces and uh which worked and he stan was very gracious about he didn't say i don't like the way you drive he actually said uh you parked that really you parked that really well you parked that really nicely do you want to see you want to see how professionals park a car and i was like okay and he showed me uh you know you aim the car at the car next to it and then you back up and you pull into the space and, um, you know, someone else, like my dad would have screamed and been like, why are you doing that? You're crazy. You're an idiot. Don't try to, you know, but Stan was like complimentary and supportive and then taught me to park the way he wanted me to park cars, which I still do. Like I do what Stan taught me. So. <laughs> so you began teaching filmmaking and currently have classes at Emory University in Atlanta. Do you enjoy teaching or directing more? Boy, um, you know, I, I love both of them. I love both of them. And, and honestly, uh, being on set is like, when I was younger, I was terrified on set and I had a lot of anxiety. And now, like I've had enough things happen that got solved that I don't really worry on set anymore. It's like a comfortable home for me to be on a set. Um, I haven't really... Well, I, I haven't been on set much since COVID and that's been, and so I'm, I'm very, I'm really missing being on set. I'm really missing being on set now. Whereas I, you know, was teaching two weeks ago and, uh, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you this though, is that I, I love teaching too. It's um, the bureaucracy around teaching is, is uh, I don't love it all. <laughs> so I guess that's, that's probably all I should say. <laughs> um does emory allow 14 year olds to audit classes you know you you can certainly audit you're welcome to audit uh my classes if you'd ever like to so uh i know i'm teaching and i'm actually teaching uh intro to film in the fall so you're welcome to uh to you're welcome to i don't know if i don't, don't know technically if you're allowed to audit it but you're certainly welcome to visit class that would be awesome i would love to do that actually that's why I asked. Um, uh, haven't you owned a blue Vol uh, Volvo? Is that how you pronounce it? Volvo? Volvo? Volvo. Volvo. Um, for many years. And have you given the car a name? No, the car never had a name. The car never had a name. Uh, Shay, my partner, may have named it, but I, I never named it. And, and actually, we lost it uh, recently, sadly. Um, what happened? It, it, you know, it's, it's so old, it's uh, 30 years old, that the, the plastic parts were deteriorating, and nobody makes them anymore. So it, it still, you know, worked, it just was too much to, to, uh, yeah, yeah, but that car would, um, I would always be meaning to get rid of it. And I would get a new car and the new car would get old and die and the Volvo would still be working. So I'd start driving the Volvo again. Uh, <laughs> um, so do you prefer fast zombies or slow zombies? I prefer clear stakes for a character that I'm rooting for. So uh, let me elaborate on that though, because um, you know, uh, 
was it called was it called 30 days of darkness uh 30 days of night um 30 days of night yeah okay so that graphic novel sold the film rights sold for a lot and it wasn't good it was just good because it was drawn in a good way but it sold for a lot and then they wrote the script and the vampires are all over the place like you you know someone can punch a vampire and then other times they can turn into super monsters who you know fly and crush people and so there's no stakes so it's not it's just like a gobbledygook like because is he gonna kill him or not i don't know because there's no rules you know and if if the audience knows there are fast zombies and that they're going to move at that speed and someone has a broken leg like that's exciting you know but if um if sometimes they move fast and sometimes they move slow like it's not exciting or it, it, that could still be exciting but if when you break rules or you don't make clear rules then it's not fun like what i want is a clear set of rules so i can root for the good guys um, were you ever a fan of the original star wars movies yeah you know and i would say that i i'm only a fan of the original star wars movie um <laughs> i think um, about that, that a lot actually mm -hmm. but yeah <laughs> um, the, uh, the, que the question behind this question is uh will you support my campaign to make a horror movie set in the star wars universe would i support you wait your campaign my campaign sure absolutely someone should <laughs> fix it <laughs> Um, you were, you earned dad value status points from your daughters by dusting your pizza pan with cornmeal, making your pizzas better than ordering or de delivery. What is the secret to cor the cornmeal dust? I'm not sure if it's a secret. It's just the way that um, some places make sure that the dough doesn't, you know, stick to the the oven. So uh, it um yeah it's the, it's not it's not a secret it's just that pizza is always delicious you know <laughs> so this last question is a sophie's choice one must die so that two may live okay. francis ford coppola's movies the, Out the outsiders toby hooper's film texas chainsaw massacre or dang it i can't i'm i'm probably gonna butcher this name Ruggiero dio Oh, uh, cannibal holocaust cannibal holocaust or or cannibal holocaust I, yeah uh, boy that's that's really tough okay um i'm sorry outsiders cannibal holocaust or what or was texas, the, chainsaw texas chainsaw massacre chainsaw massacre uh you know i um in my heart i think i think the one that I think that I think the outsiders helps a lot of people. Like I think it helps a lot of people. And I think that of the two, I'm more interested in. I love all three of those movies. You might know that from your research, but I think of the two great films, the more interesting one is Cannibal Holocaust. And so I feel like also if Texas Chainsaw Massacre died all of the sequels would die <laughs> the bad ones so aha <laughs> uh -huh, i found my solution <laughs> i mean it's true <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so your answer is cannibal holocaust and the outsiders uh, so those like those those, those, get those to would, live, right would live would live yeah yes those get to live yes yeah. Uh oh wait. Oh sorry, I read it wrong. Crap. Oh no. <laughs> oh no, get... this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. Um it's two must die. Good lord. <laughs> two must die so one may live. Oh no. Well, I you know, I would I would lose I would lose um the outsiders because there's also uh rumblefish and more people should pay attention to rumblefish. So that, that one's that one's a little easier at this point <laughs> okay so uh cannibal so the one that would live is cannibal holocaust, holocaust and I, I also didn't you used to have viewing parties of cannibal holocaust yes yeah yes <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so thank you for sitting down with me today. Um, it was a pleasure, there, man. Yeah. Is there anything you want to say before we finish? Um, yeah. If you're, if, well, obviously you won't hear this unless you're watching it, but um, if anyone out there, you know, wants to be a filmmaker or an actor or uh, do any type of creative thing, the way that you get to be that is by doing it. So just, just, I hate to be like a Nike ad, but just do it. Like filmmakers make films. If you're making films, you're a filmmaker. Also, do you have any questions for me before we go? I don't know. It's um, just something I say. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I think you're a really charming kid, and I, uh, I, um, I, I hope you, uh, I hope you show up to uh, class. Um, so I, I guess I don't have a question right now, but hopefully you'll come to class and make some movies. I plan on it. So yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, what do you have coming up and where, where can the audience find you? Um, uh, I think I'm on Instagram and Facebook as Rob Schmidt Film. And, uh, um, you know, I had a movie this year that just didn't get cast. So uh, it's not clear what I don't like to talk about stuff until it's I actually I used to say that I don't like to talk about things until they're greenlit. And then I was actually on a movie that was greenlit and the it, it the uh studio um was running some kind of financial scam and ran out of money like two weeks into production and uh and so after that i started saying i, I don't i don't like to talk about what i'm going to make next until it's done um <laughs> so um you know we'll see we'll see but i do i i'm i'm really dying to be back on set and uh so there you have it. Um, thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to stop recording real quick.